All right, let's reconvene. Now that we understand the situation, go ahead, Rudy. Okay, so we've reached the point of the open session agenda where we're going to entertain concept approval uh, before an HGRI can, or any institute at NIH can publish a request for applications, uh, they have to take the concept uh, to the council to be approved. So we have three presentations today. Uh, you will hear about the concept, descriptions of the concept, and then we, rec we welcome questions from council, and then we'll take a vote to hopefully approve all of them. So we're gonna start with Lisa Chadwick. And this is the Supporting Talented Early Career Researchers in Genomics. This is an RFA that is being renewed. Okay. I, uh, I think we all are aware that it is not easy to get an NIH grant. I'm sure many of you are aware of that at a personal level. Um, and it's especially difficult for researchers who are at early stages of their research career to get funding from the NIH. So these are two graphs that are from a, an old... 2017 presentation to the advisory uh, council to the director of the NIH about this problem. Um, what you can see on the first graph is that the number of people who are applying for NIH grants keeps going up, right? So that's the blue line on the top. But the number of people who are getting funded was not really going up that much. Um, and then the graph on the right uh, shows the proportion of those funded researchers at different career stages. So the red line is the one that looks the most concerning. That's the early career researchers. That's PIs under the age of 45. So you can see that they were making up a lower and lower percentage of the funded investigators. So in response to this concern, the NIH um, launched this Next Generation Researchers Initiative, NGRI, which is a very confusing acronym when you work at NHGRI. Um, and uh, one of the career stages that this initiative focuses on is early stage investigators. So just to remind you what an early stage investigator is, that's a researcher who is within 10 years of finishing their terminal research degree. Um, and they also have never been the PI of a substantial NIH research grant. So that's like an R01 or equivalent to an R01. Um, the NGRI uh, convened a working group. Uh, our own council member, Tim Reddy, was on that working group uh, to make recommendations. And some of the recommendations were um, for uh, institutes to think about strategies to grow and retain ESIs in their grant portfolio. Um, they also instituted a centralized tracking of ESI funding at the NIH. Uh, they establish a target every year for the number of investigators that they want to fund, and then they track it to make sure that we're hitting that. Um, and then also encouraged institutes to place a greater emphasis on specific funding opportunities targeted for early stage investigators. So how does NHGRI specifically support researchers at this career stage? Well, one of the biggest ways that we do it is through funding researchers who apply through the parent announcements. So uh, all of you early stage investigators who are watching me right now, this is your reminder that you can submit grants through the parent announcements. Um, you still get benefits for doing that. Um, and uh, our program staff are all here to help you sort of navigate that process. And so I would encourage you to reach out to us to uh, help with that. Um, but we do also participate in a number of other targeted announcements that are geared towards either early stage investigators or new investigators, um, such as the Stephen Katz Early Stage Investigator PAR, um, and then two uh, PARs for, that are more for new or at-risk investigators and with an emphasis on promoting workforce diversity. So we also have had some of our own uh, funding announcements, like this one, the Supporting Talented Early Career Researchers in Genomics. So this has a focus on early stage investigators. You have to be an early stage investigator at the time the award is made in order to be eligible. Um, all areas of research that NHGRI funds are open to submit to this announcement. Um, it does have a focus on career development, so we ask the applicants to form an advisory panel. That's really just to make sure that these researchers at this very critical career stage have as much support as possible to help them be successful in their career. 
Um, we also ask for a letter that describes the institutional support um, to make sure that they're not, that they have that. Um, and then we also ask them to um, attend a grantee meeting. So we have been asking them to attend the NHGRI training and career development meeting, which has a lot of great content about career development sort of topics. This was an R01. Um, and it, so it has sort of the traditional format of an R01. And this is the RFA that we are seeking to renew today. Um, we, this was a three-year RFA. So we actually have already had two years of this. Um, these are the uh, grantees that we made awards to in the first two years of this program. We've actually already got the applications in for the last receipt date, but um, those awards won't be going out until the next fiscal year. Um, so it's been a successful program so far. And our proposal is just to renew it in essentially exactly the same format. Um, again, a, another three-year RFA with one due date per year. We plan to, again, use the R01 uh, activity code. Um, we have a $2 million set aside for, uh, to fund applications that come in from this RFA. And I am not proposing to make any significant changes, although I am looking forward to hearing your feedback. Um, I know Tim and Judy are going to lead off the discussion for this. Um, so I'll lead off. You know, certainly this is critical that we continue to support early career researchers um, in genomics, and, and uh, you know, I'm very supportive of continuing to have um, effort in this area. Um, how are we meeting the NGRI goals? Are we aligned with them? Yeah. So we're doing good. We can do better. Um, one of the goals, as you know, is to sort of have the funding rates or the success rates for early stage investigators be as close to that of established investigators as possible. And I would say we're not getting that as much as I would like. Um, so uh, we have found that having announcements like this one and the Genomic Innovator, which was the program that preceded this, have been helpful in getting us closer to achieving those goals. But we definitely you know, need to do better. And this is just one part of the way that we're trying to achieve that. Are the application rates high enough also? I, I would love to get more applications to yeah. come in for this. Um, I think sometimes early stage investigators, and I understand this, never think that they're ready for an R01. But um, early stage investigators, when those grants are being reviewed, they're reviewing your sort of preliminary data and everything in the context of your career stage. Um, and so I, I think that it's definitely possible for people to be submitting an R01 even at this early career stage. Does the one due date per year impact that, do you think, or is that? Um, that's a great question. Um, do you have thoughts about whether that would? <clears throat> I mean, I think if a early stage investigator, first of all, the, the cutoff is pretty strict, right? So that could put people past that deadline when they might be able to get a renewal or revision in, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and I'm, what, when is the due date? It's uh, the end of February. Okay, so I mean, it is kind of aligned with the academic year, yeah. but nevertheless. You, you are right, though, that more having due dates is better. one due date does, they have, they have to wait for the next exactly. one. If they don't get funded, right. they, they have nothing to do. And their ESI um, status could expire in that time, too. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, this is an incredibly needed program, uh, especially given kind of the complexity of a lot of the genomics. And my mind is thinking a little bit towards late bloomers, like mm -hmm. maybe the folks that through the consortia, through team science, may be introduced uh, to, to research for the first time. Um, were you planning to give folks in team science kind of a different kind of instruction in the review process or give them a break if they're like, you know, they don't have necessarily the requisite normal number of first author or last author publications. We're going to give some advice to the review panel uh, during that process because I think this is terribly important and I right. think it's going to be great. Yeah, so that's a great question, Judy. Um, so the Genomic Innovator Program, which actually was the RFA before this one, was only open to people who had participated in team science. And I, I don't think that that was like... The, a great, the way that that program was set up with the R35, it wasn't the right fit for that program at the time and that sort of group of individuals. Um, but we do recognize that that's an issue. I would also say, though, that the reviewers for this RFA, are that this is a review panel that's convened by NHGRI. Those reviewers are all very familiar with the, the issues 
behind being involved in team science. Genomics is such a team science sport just in general. So um, I think that the review panel probably does have a good appreciation for that, um, but we can think about maybe adding some language to the review criteria or something that helps strengthen that. Uh, that, that would be terrific because a lot of the best data sets, resources, and opportunities are going to be in these large consortia. Right. It seems that you have to present a career development uh, section in the grant. Yeah. How does this grant get scored? Is it purely on the scientific aspect of it, or do they do you also score on the career development? Yeah, the, that's not a scorable um, okay. component. Yeah. But you want that in there. Yes. Okay. It's not called out as a separate criterion, but it, do, it is a score driving element. For the overall impact score is influenced by that plan, but unlike investigator uh, approach, it, it does not have a separate criterion score. Thank you. Kelly, did you have a question? Thank you, Nancy. I did. I was having a hard time figuring out how to raise my hand. So, you know, um, if I, the chart you showed, the numbers that you really have, I think go like, you know, up to 45, right? Where you say young people and, uh, and that could be debated if 45 is young or not. I agree. But, but the, the, um, 10 year period post, um, uh, the last degree, significant degree you received. I mean, does it make sense if that's, if, if we're counting people like below 45 as, as it, in that chart, does it, would it make sense to increase from the 10 year period, maybe up to a 15 year period? Would, would that increase your applications you think? So, um, okay. So the chart, you're right. The age, that's not something that we typically, that we use as like a defining criteria. And that was just part of that report. And I agree with you. Actually, I think 45 is young. And so is older than 45, <laughs> FYI. Um, but um, so I think what you're saying though, that the ESI designation is like an NIH wide sort of thing, but new investigators are basically the same thing as an early stage investigator, except they're they may be beyond that 10 year period. So they still haven't gotten a major NIH grant, um, but they're not within that sort of 10 year time frame. So the way to make something available to that group too is to open it to new investigators and early stage investigators. The Genomic Innovator Program, which was our last RFA about this, um, was open to ESIs and new investigators. I would say that the vast, vast majority of applicants to that were ESIs. Um, but you're right that uh, new investigators also are generally in that sort of early career as well. Yeah, so I, I, one, one of the curves that you showed um, shows the increasing proportion of people over 60. Yeah. And I, you know, it, uh, it's crazy. I saw somebody somewhere break it out by baby boomers. The baby boomer generation is sucking up a, still a huge proportion of, NIH, of the NIH dollars. And I, I'm a, I, as a baby boomer in the middle of the baby <laughs> boom, like really enough already. Like <laughs> we, we need to do a better job of teaching the young people how we do this successfully, right? Um, but it's, it's a little bit crazy. And I, I had nothing but admiration for Janet Rowley when she got a, scored a third percentile on a grant when she was 82 um, that went in. And I don't doubt, does out, doubt it for one second that she deserved that funding. But I, I, I do worry that it's such a big cohort that we're starving the younger, the, the whole cohorts of people right behind us. And I, I don't have a simple solution, but I, I, I'm, it's, it's a really disturbing thing to see. I 
I'm not going to comment, but I, I will just say that um, there is a finite amount of NIH funding, right? And you know from the director's report slide and this morning, it's not getting larger. So that is a, it's a real challenge, what you, what you mentioned. Casey? Yes, thanks. Um, so I was just curious about the competitive renewal process, if this has been around long enough for, for that to happen, and how has it been successful or... Um, yeah, just wanted to hear more about that. So it hasn't it hasn't yet. So the the there's really only two years of, of awards of this. Um, the other program, the Genomic Innovator, which you uh, got a, one of those Genomic Innovator awards, uh, that does not have a renewal path. Uh, you you have to go and write a, a new R01. Um, but uh, no, we don't we don't know that yet for for these ones. Okay. Even the Genomic Innovator. The first crop of genomic innovator awardees, I think, are only in their last year. No, that makes sense. I, I'm curious about uh, whether for this cohort there's maybe opportunities for training on that po process, or if maybe as part of the resources that are available, um, having examples of successful re um, ma materials for that. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm always looking for ways to bulk that up. Uh, I do a lot of outreach sessions, and I, we have an early stage investigator webpage where I've put together a bunch of resources, but we can always do more. If you have ever ideas about what I could put on that page that would make it more valuable to people, I definitely want to hear that. Any questions from re remote participants? And if not, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the concept. Oh, a second. All in favor? Okay. Anyone opposed? Anyone wishing to abstain? Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks.